Praise the Lord, brethren. I wanted to make this video and speak about abiding in Christ. The other day I made a post about what does it actually mean to abide in Christ? We hear it all the time. We know the verse that says, um, if you abide in me, you shall bear much fruit. And we're so familiar. It's one of those verses that we just know so well that we kind of just put it in the back and say, I already know what that means. And then we move on to the next verse and we look for the next greater revelation and mystery out there to try to discern and decipher. But really, we need to go back and we need to really digest the words that Jesus Christ spoke. We need to ruminate on the words that Jesus Christ spoke and really dwell on them, meditate on them and really see the full meaning of what it means. And look at the context of the verse. Look at the co-text, multiple multiple texts in Scripture, you know, and uh, really see that the spirit of the word that was spoken, Amen. As Jesus did with the Father's commandments, he he didn't just look at the letter of the law. For thousands of years, uh, or hundreds of years, Israel just looked at the the letter of the law. They they sought to obey the letter of the law, you know. To a T. Jesus said the Pharisees, they even tithe of their mint and their cumin, of their spices. They were getting 10% of their mint and going and tithing out of that. Like it was so to a T that they were examining the letter of the law, but they failed to examine the spirit of the law. Jesus Christ looked at the Ten Commandments and he saw the spirit behind the commandment and not just the command. Not just why is God, not just that God is telling me to do this, but he saw the deeper meaning as to why it was truly destructive. You know, that's why he could say things like, uh, he who hates his brother commits murder in his heart. You see, the, the Israelites they were okay with not committing murder. They were saying, well, I'm obeying God. I'm loving God because I'm not obeying, uh, I'm obeying the Ten Commandments because I haven't committed murder. And that's all God said to do. I don't have to murder. As long as I... Don't murder, I'm okay. But meanwhile, in their hearts, they were having murderous thoughts. They were having murderous attitudes, murderous feelings. They were slaying people in their heart. And Jesus Christ said, to hate your brother is to have committed murder in your heart. He also looked at the spirit of uh, the law of uh, adultery, right? So you had these people that were saying, I have not committed adultery. There's people today even that try to justify it. I've, I've heard these people come up to me and say, well, it's not adultery if uh, the person's not married. It's only adultery if the person is is married. And that's not what Jesus said. Jesus Christ said, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, then you have committed adultery in your heart. So Jesus, again, taking it a step farther, past the mere letter, taking it farther. And that's that's my desire and goal when I look at the Word of God. I want to go far with it. I want to draw near to God with it. I want to get as close to God as I can when I read His Word. I want to draw near to God and pray that He draws near to me. Amen. And I'm not talking about adding to His Word. I'm not talking about getting uh, super spiritual and, and coming up with your own philosophies or doctrines of what the Word means because we don't want to do that either. But we want to use the Bible to define the Bible. And I want to speak today on abiding in Christ. So when I asked the brethren, what does it mean to abide in Christ? Many of their first responses were to obey him, to obey him. You know, that was the, the most majority response, you know. And of course, in John uh, 15, 14, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments, you know, or if you love me, obey my commandments, some say. So we can we can run with that really quickly. That's like an easy answer. But I think there's more to it than just obeying God. And, and what I want to speak on will hopefully enlighten that to us. So anyways, I want to read first about that verse where Jesus is commanding us to abide in him. Here in John chapter 15, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, 
except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except you abide in me. So there we have a very clear commandment from Jesus Christ. He's commanding us to abide in him. In fact, he says, if you do not abide in him, you will bear no fruit. And right before that, he told us what happens to the branches that bear no fruit. He said his father takes them away. Okay, so he separates them from the vine and he takes them away. It said that in verse 2, very clearly, it says, Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he then purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. You see, and even in purging, it's not pleasing in the times of, uh, you know, disciplining, chastising, uh, humbling. It can seem like a, like a wearisome thing that can make people grow weary. But we're commanded not to grow weary, even in uh, being purged, even in being chastised and being disciplined. It says that he scourges every son whom he receives. Amen. He, he, he says that in uh, Revelation chapter 3, it says he rebukes and chastens those he loves. Amen. So we need to look at the, the purging as a good thing, as an example of God's love. You know, like when we were first saved, we, like the first thing we realized was God loved us. Right. And we were so happy about that. And we just knew God loved us because his word says, you know, and that's good. That's good to know that we, that's we stand on his word. His word says, uh, says that, but as we grow older, as we mature in the faith, the way to really identify God's love for you is that is he's, is he correcting you? Is he rebuking you? Is he edifying you? If you're, if you're walking out of his, of his spirit or out of his love and going into other things, is he, is he like a shepherd with his staff drawing you back to follow Jesus Christ in the narrow way? Or does he just let you run amok and do whatever you want? Because that's not the way the shepherd operates. Neither does any good father or parent operate like that with their children. They're going to teach them the way to go and they're going to discipline their children if they love them, if they go off course. So likewise, the father purges those who bear fruit and Jesus rebukes and chastises those he loves. So that they'll be corrected and bear more fruit. Amen. So let's keep reading. It says, Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. So then he command, he does a command, but he sets a law standard out for us to all understand and to receive and say yes and amen, Lord. When he says that a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. So that means... We need to really understand what it means to abide in the vine of Jesus Christ. If not, the Father is going to separate us from the vine, it says, if we don't bear fruit. Right? And we can't bear fruit unless we abide in the vine. So what does it mean to abide in the vine? Is it just obeying Him? Is that all I have to do? If I just obey Jesus in the letter of the law, am I just going to abide in the vine? Am I going to prevail? Well, let's see. Let's keep reading. And it says here in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You see, so now it's a two-part deal. It's not just one. Now it's not just me abiding in him. It says in verse 5, it says, But he who abides in me and I in him. You see, now we see a two-part to this deal. It's no longer just something that I'm doing, but also something that Christ must do. Christ has an eye in him. So the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You see, so just trying to obey God in my own strength and not really abiding in Christ, it says I can do nothing unless he is also abiding in me. So which brings me to my next point is how are we to abide together with anyone? Okay. That's, that's the answer to our question. How can you abide with somebody uh, in your household? How can you abide with someone in a godly marriage? This is something that I'm surprised. Only like one or two people mentioned this out of all the people that responded. And the answer is love. That's the true answer. Love. You can abide with another person if you're abiding in love. If there's no love there between you both, then you're not going to be abiding together. In the marriage, if there's no love in the household, then the husband and the wife will not abide together. 
And likewise, the children will not abide under their authority or headship either. There will be chaos. There will be discord. It's so important to have love in order to abide. Let's keep reading. It says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Okay, referring to angels as men right there, right? Because there's never in the Bible are angels referenced as a woman, right? They're always referenced as a man. Every time they've been seen, they've been seen in the form of a man. But they're not man, they're angels, but they're always referenced as men. Anyways, so here Jesus is referring to that day. He says that those that do not abide in him, they're going to be cast forth. They're going to be like a withered branch. And they're going to be cast into the fire and they're going to be burned. And then he says in verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As a Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Verse 9, that's the key. That's the answer. Oftentimes when Jesus is preaching and he's speaking, especially when he's speaking to his apostles and disciples, he's always giving you the answer right after and telling us how we can do something. If we'll just keep reading, instead of just take one verse out of context and run off, if we keep reading, he's going to answer it. He's going to reveal it to our hearts. God is not the author of a confusion. He doesn't want us to be confused. He doesn't want us to be um lost he wants us to be found he wants us to be following him and he gives us a spirit of love power and a sound mind in jesus name so right there it says as the father has loved me so have i loved you continue ye in my love then he goes on to say if you keep my commandments you shall abide in my love even as i have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love so we see again, it's not just keeping the commandments, but it's abiding in his love. That's the answer. That is the key to victory. That's the key to victory over sin in your life. That's the key to following Christ. That's the key to overcoming. That's the key to uh, rejoicing in persecution. It's by abiding in his love. That's what Jesus Christ did constantly. He was abiding in the love of his Father. The Father loved Jesus Christ. He made it known to Jesus Christ. He made it known publicly. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. That was before he did any ministry. That was before he went out and started making disciples. That was before he went out and started doing public ministry and casting out demons and all that stuff and any miracles. And yet the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So the father was already pleased with Jesus by how he was living his life. Full of faith. For it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So Jesus Christ was living fully by faith. It's just so beautiful to see that and to see that love and that relationship that they had together, that true unity with one another as one. That's why Jesus can say, I am one with my Father. And um, that's what we need to have. That's what we need to be operating out of, oneness with the Father. Not just operating just because, oh, well, Jesus told me to do this. That's why. I'm just obeying because, well, Jesus said I got to love my neighbor, so I guess I'll do it. You know, oh, it's so, you know, how are you going to love your enemies like Jesus Christ said to do? He said, you need to love your enemies. You need to bless those who curse you. You need to do good to them who despitefully use you. Try and do that in your own strength, and you will not get very far. But if you're abiding in the love of the Father, if you're continuing in the love of Jesus Christ, you're going to have the strength to do that because the Bible says that His grace is made perfect in weakness. Amen. So in your weakness, you can rely on God's strength. The Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Amen. Let's keep reading. He says in verse 9, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, 
and that your joy might be full. This is the commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name he may give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Look what our Lord says. He says, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. The apostles knew that the world hated him. This was before he was crucified. This was before he went to the cross. He says, you know the world hated me. The way our Lord lived on earth was so powerful. Such holy fellowship with God the Father and the world hated that. He was the perfect man on earth. And the world hated him. He could say this and not be a liar. He can say this and be a man of truth because it's true. In John 7, 7 he says, He says, The world hated me because I testified that their deeds were evil. That's why they hated him. Because he called out sin. And today the brethren of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, are hated when they call out sin. And when they testify that the deeds of the world are evil, they are also hated. But Jesus said, it's not you that they hate. It's me. It's Jesus Christ. When they hate us for speaking the words of Jesus Christ, it's not us they're rejecting. It's Jesus Christ. He said, rejoice in that day. When you're persecuted, when you're reviled, when you're insulted, when you're beaten, when you're killed, when you're persecuted, when you're imprisoned for his namesake, he said, blessed art thou. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For in like manner they did unto the prophets that were before you. You see? That's another command. We have to rejoice in persecution and rejections of the world. It says, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. That's why the world hates you, brethren. Glory be to God. If the world loves you, it's because you're it's his own, according to Jesus Christ's word. Many of these preachers that go on TV, these televangelists with uh, football stadium congregations, the world loves them. They can go on Oprah and Oprah can smile and say, well, yeah, we love you. You're a great person. There's many ways to Jesus. And they'll say blasphemies like that. There's many ways to the Father. And these men won't stand up on the word of God because they're not of Jesus Christ, because he did not call them out of the world. Therefore, the world loved them. It says in verse 20, Remember that the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. They will keep yours also. You see that? Because why? Because the sayings that we're saying are not our own. But we're being led by the Holy Spirit that's speaking through us to one another, to edify each other, to build each other up. There's so much discord and division by people online that come in and somebody will quote a verse of the Lord Jesus Christ and people will go there and be quick to attack them. And that's because they don't keep his sayings, so they don't keep yours either. Don't be saddened by this, brethren. Rejoice. Rejoice and cry out to the Lord for those souls that are lost. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. 
If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And you shall bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Amen. These things have I written, these things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They shall pull you out of the synagogues. Yeah, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he does God's service. And these things they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. Amen. Glory be to God. These are the precious words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. These are the days that are before us. These are the days that are coming in our land and they're already in other parts of the world where people are already being killed and they're thinking that they're doing God a service when they kill Jesus Christ's servants. Those days are coming here and we can already see it the way that the brethren get attacked by the brethren so fiercely, so viciously, like a den of vipers. They encircle them like the bulls of Bashan. They encamp around him and sneer at them. When they speak the words of Jesus Christ, woe to those who attack the men of God and sisters of God. Glory be to God. Now, to continue on here, you can say, you can disagree with me. Well, yeah, but you have to obey. You have to obey. You know, you could be one of those people. Of course, I agree. We have to obey. But that's not the end all be all. You have to love God. In order to obey the right way, you have to love God. You have to be in a love relationship with God, where you're in love with God. Let's read here in Revelation chapter 2. It's called the Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Hallelujah. In the book of Revelation chapter 2, it says, Under the angel of the church of Ephesus. Look at this, Ephesus. This is the book of Ephesians we're talking about here. Go back and reread the book of Ephesians that you all know so well about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, but you guys don't usually read verse 10, right? Go back and read that verse, okay? And then, and then turn to chapter 2 in Revelation and look up the second letter of Ephesians written by Jesus Christ. And see what Jesus Christ has to say to the Ephesian church and to us, the body of Christ. Amen. This was a church that Paul said is saved by grace through faith. Right? So they were saved by grace through faith. They had grace. That's all they needed. They had faith. That's all they needed. Right? According to Jesus Christ here, it says that he has something against them. Let's look at this. It says, chapter 2. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou cannot bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and hast borne and has patience for my namesake, and has labored and not fainted. Look at all these commendations Jesus Christ gives this church. It's amazing. I wish I can go to a church like this. It says, I know thy works and thy labor, thy patience. That's the fruit of the Spirit is patience. They have patience. They cannot bear them which are evil. That means they hate evil. Okay, it says, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And has found them liars. So this church can also identify false prophets. They can identify these false money hungry TV preachers. That are devils. Like Kenneth Copeland and the rest of them. 
They can see these wicked men that are liars, that are not apostles, that are getting fat off the flock, fleecing the flock, trying to get rich off of God's people because they don't have the Spirit of God. This church can identify those, and it says they have borne, they have patience. For my name's sake, they have labored, they're laboring for God, they're in ministry, they have not fainted, they have not fainted, right? They have not denied His name. They have not grown weary while doing good. They haven't turned from doing good to do evil. It says, Nevertheless, I have someone against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. It's amazing that this church can have all these amazing things, yet our great and glorious God, who is excellingly higher and much greater than our greatest thoughts could ever be, His thoughts are higher than ours, His ways are higher than ours, and this great God of ours, He says, I have somewhat against you. Although in our minds we can be the church of Ephesians and have everything laid out clear and plain and think that we're victorious, think that we're this mighty Christians with a name. Even one church who who was dead, he said that you have a name, but thou art dead. There was a dead church, but they had a name as being a good church. But to this church, he says, they have all these wonderful things. They have this ministry going. They have patience. They have discernment. They're able to tell false prophets, false apostles, false teachers. But then still the great God, I am, has something against this church. And he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Amen. And it said that the Nicolaitans were a wicked group of people that followed a doctrine of uh, immorality. They lived in open immorality, sexual immorality, and every type of immorality you can think of. And they thought that they could give their body unto these unclean things and fornication and go openly fornicate and sleep with people outside of marriage, go out and get drunk, go out and go do big feastings, go out and do whatever they wanted to please their flesh because they thought they were already saved by grace so that they were good. They were wicked people. Jesus Christ says he hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He hates their doctrine. And this is another thing that that church had as well. So we see seven commendations. He says your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance, that you cannot stand evildoers, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for, hardships for my name. You have not grown weary, and you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. We see those seven things. They had a lot of obedience to Jesus Christ, a lot of obeying His commands. But what they didn't have was love. They didn't have the same love that they had for Jesus Christ at the beginning. And a lot of people, they look at this verse and they say, oh, it just means repent and do the first works. It means like, you know, when you first come to God, you know, you're, you're like, you're on fire and you just got to go back there and be on fire again and just go do more works. It's not what it means. I even once thought it was similar to meaning like that. But as I kept looking and searching, what does it really mean? God revealed to me what it really means. According to a scripture, and it's abiding in his love. He says, I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. We need to return to our first love. And that's what, that means we need to love God. We need to be doing everything that we're doing out of a love for God. It's not just out, oh, I need to go street preach over here. I need to go witness. I need to go evangelize. I need to go to church three, four, five times a week. That's what I need to do. If I do all these things, then I can get closer to God up the ladder. No, that's not how it works. You have to have a personal relationship with God. Where you actually go and spend time with the person that you love more than anyone on earth. That's what it's about. <coughs> Jesus Christ says, return to your first love. Remember, therefore, where you are fallen. Right? And he says in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. 
He didn't say you lost your first love. He said you left it. You left your first love and you let something else come and take you away from it. If it was lost, you wouldn't know where it was, but you left it so you know exactly where it is. You know where you left it. And I'm encouraging you, brethren, if you've left your first love, then you know where he is. Go and return to him swiftly. Go seek him. Go and find him and drop what you're doing now and go and seek his face because he is more important than anything else in this world. Go and seek God in the prayer closet, brethren. That is the most important thing. That is how we are to abide in Jesus Christ. Not just by doing works and doing good deeds and obeying His commands, but abiding in Him. That's why we obey Him. We don't just obey Him because He's told us to obey Him. We obey Him because we love Him. Amen? Because we're more than just servants, like He said. It's a lower level of servitude and that's servanthood. But he said, you're more than servants, you're friends because I've revealed all things to you, right? It's like the prodigal son, when he returns, he wants to come back and be a servant. He's like, I'll just go back to my dad's house and I'll just obey everything he said and I'll be good. No, the father gives him a robe. He puts around his robe of righteousness instantly. After he just comes to him and confesses his sin, the father then covers him. And he gives him a ring, a signet ring upon his finger. Amen. Praise God. And then he sits him at his table and he kills the fatted calf. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when one sinner repents. Praise God. That's huge. God rejoices at that. God is merciful. He suffers long. The father suffered long for his son to come back as his son was out sleeping with the pigs and eating the food of pigs and living in the mud, living in the filth of the world, wasting his inheritance, wasting his calling that God called him and gave him this beautiful inheritance. But finally that son returns to his father's house. So I'm calling you, brethren, to return to your father's house. Return to your first love and do it out of love. Remember when you first came to God, when you served him, when it wasn't at work? Was it wasn't a strenuous thing when you didn't have to make time for it because he was all your time? Because he, he was your first love. It was like you fell in love for the first time because he first loved you. Amen. Jesus Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, the Bible says. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. Extended his love to us. And some received it, others rejected it. What are you going to do with God's love, brethren? I pray you're encouraged by this message, brethren. That you realize that these are the days when people are going to be killing each other. They're going to be killing brothers. Brother is going to betray brother. And the way that they're going to betray him is they're going to seek to kill the brother. And they're going to side with, with the devil government of this world. And what this world says is good, these betrayers will say amen to that. And they will kill their brothers who says, no, it's not good. It's not good. What they're calling good is actually evil. And they're going to kill the body of Christ. And they're going to say that they're doing God a service to get rid of these evil men. <sighs> Brethren, I pray you're encouraged. I pray you're uplifted to abide in Jesus Christ, that you would abide in him. That you would continue in his love. That you would return to that love relationship. That you would be walking by faith out of love. That you will be obeying God's commandments out of love for him. Not just out of fear of going to hell. Not just so that you can get a benefit and a reward. So you can get a wife or a house. But so that you can get God. Let him be your reward and portion. Amen. There's many that come to God out of fear, and it doesn't last long. Because as soon as the fear leaves, they get comfort in their sins, and they go back to it. But those who come because of love, may they hold on to that love, and may they cling fast to that love, and remember why they came. Remember why you gave your life to God. Remember why. Remember, remember that the Lord has loved you. 
and called you, brethren, to come forth, that he has ordained you to bear fruit and to go forth. Our highest calling, our greatest commandment is this, to love God with all of your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. God bless you, brethren. Peace and love and grace in Jesus Christ be multiplied unto you. Amen.